In the last video lecture, we established the idea of a development in the American economy throughout the early 19th century, something that we've defined as capitalism and free market exchange. Um, I told you at the time that there would be deep and profound implications for American life, both socially as well as politically, with respect to the development of capitalism. One thing that we spent quite a bit of time on would be this issue of the Erie Canal and how in a capitalist economy, transportation is absolutely paramount. If you remember from the last time, the major accomplishment of the Erie Canal was that it, uh, it, it hooked up consumers in the growing parts of the West, Ohio, Michigan, Indiana, with where places that produced products like New York, and Philadelphia were based out of. In any case, I want to pick it up there with this conversation that involves what historians call the transportation revolution. Now, naturally, what I mean by this is a breakthrough when it comes to moving both people as well as products around this vast North American continent. If you're following along with me um, on the PowerPoint slide, you're looking at that graph there uh, that, that, that demonstrates this. In the year 1800, as you can see, most people got around with a horse and covered wagon. And for approximately 30 cents per mile, you could haul a ton of something. Uh, that could be wheat, that could be tobacco, that could be any commodity that you wanted it to be. By the year 1850, however, that price had gotten cut in half. And you really have to ask yourself, what happened there? Um, it was not that we had stronger, faster, more capable horses had no, uh, nothing to do with the reinvention of the wagon wheel. It had everything to do with the fact that there were uh, um, technological advances that did not exist in the year 1800. Um, a good example would be the steamboat. Um, the steamboat was not around in the year 1800, but by the year 1850, it, it's, it's transporting a ton of something for half a penny per mile. That is a really really efficient breakthrough. It's very, very good, and it's a game changer when it comes to economic expansion, because now all of a sudden, not only can people out in the West um, enjoy a higher standard of living with cheaper prices, they can also export that pork, that wheat, that barley that they're producing in the Midwest back to the East where it might be manufactured into consumer items. Um, now, you have to ask yourself how and why the steamboats were, were so cheap and so effective. And, and the answer to that is similar to the steamboat. The railroad was not invented in the year 1800. And even by the standards of the 1850s, the railroad was not perfected the way that you think of the railroad here today. Long story short, the railroads were even more efficient than the steamboat. And obviously, what you need if you're going to navigate via water is water and if you don't have water you either have to dig a canal which is very laborious and can be very costly or you have to go way 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 out of your way to get to wherever it is that you're talking about the railroad is going to cut this travel time in half and it's going to make it infinitely infinitely more convenient to get around this vast nation and so naturally very similar to the horse and wagons if you want to remain relevant, you want people to continue to patron your business, you need to give them a reason. The railroad is giving them a reason in the sense that it's very convenient and they don't need water to move from point A to point B. The steamboats are giving them a reason in that, if you look at that graph, uh, the railroads need four cents per mile. The steamboats only need half a cent per mile. So now it might not be as convenient, but you make up that convenience with respect to the price. Any way that you want to look at this, the transportation revolution is a byproduct of the capitalist system, and it's a generally positive thing. It's, it generally raises the standard of living across the board. Um, it makes life more convenient, and it also expands the economy, thereby creating more demand. As you're going to see, not everybody thought that way. And even in our day and age, the 21st century, um, not everybody sees an institution like Amazon Prime, for example, or Amazon, generally speaking, as a really, really good thing in the American economy. Just like today, there were 
competitors in the marketplace, region by region and even state by state. And to some extent, some of these producers had an incentive to make sure that the people in their state only purchased products that were made by their fellow statesmen. Think of it this way. If you were producing something in New York, you don't want to compete with those producers in New Jersey. You want to have a lock on that New York market. So one thing that you might consider doing is blocking down the transportation networks from New Jersey or Pennsylvania for that matter, blocking them and restricting the flow of goods from outside of your state to the interior. This would essentially give you a monopoly on the state of New York's economy. Um, this becomes a very serious and contentious issue uh, early in the 19th century. The idea that there were regions and states and even local uh, municipalities that did not want to compete with the bigger, broader world. All of this is going to come to a head in terms of whether or not this was legal uh, in 1824 with a Supreme Court case ruling entitled Gibbons versus Ogden. Um, what Gibbons versus Ogden ultimately said was that it is the power of Congress to regulate internal trade, right? If you think back to um, the Constitution, the ratification of the Constitution, one big reason that we ratify the Constitution is that the nationalist faction wanted one universal external trade policy. If there was a tariff placed on British textiles in Massachusetts, we wanted that tariff to apply in South Carolina as well. As it turns out, the Supreme Court went one step further with this Gibbons decision. It said not only can Congress make rules and regulate those rules externally, in other words, Great Britain, but it could do so internally as well. It could tell those good people in New York, I'm sorry, but you have to open up your borders to everybody that wants to do business within your state, whether they're New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, etc., etc. In other words, there would be no monopolies when it comes to state or even municipal markets. Congress would have the power to regulate internal trade, and it did. Um, the other thing that I want to make mention of with respect to transportation would be the railroads. Now, in this particular instance, we're a little bit ahead of ourselves when it comes to when railroads really do go mainstream. We're really in the infancy of the railroad industry. It's not really going to hit its stride until at the very earliest, the 1860s. Um, but uh, really, you could even make the case of the 1870s. So most of what we're going to talk about when it comes to the railroads is actually going to be for more of a modern American history class. But one thing that I think that we can say right now that, that will make not only some sense, but will we'll make an impression down the road when we get to uh, the 1850s, was that the railroad capital of the United States is going to come in Chicago uh, by the 1850s. And what I mean by that is that all railroad lines, relatively speaking, are leading through Chicago. Um, if you think about um, an, an airport hub uh, where companies like Delta, United, uh, Southwest, what have you, that they, they all like to fly into, inevitably you'll, you'll think of a place like Chicago O'Hare, um, Atlanta. Uh, you think of a place like LAX or DFW Airport. Um, all of these are very huge airports and all of these major airline carriers go through them and therefore there's a lot of not only people but also commerce, money, that is flowing through those centers. That's essentially what the railroad brought to Chicago. Um, it's really the railroad that will make Chicago and it becomes the massive urban uh, and industrial center that you think of it as today, primarily because of the railroad. One quick example, John Deere. Um, most of you think of lawnmowers when I say John Deere. Um, and you're right, but long before there were lawnmowers or even lawns, um, John Deere was a blacksmith in the Virginia region of the country. And he was a guy that specialized in metal plows. And although Virginia certainly had a market for farmers, there was certainly people to sell his stuff to there, 
Chicago is becoming increasingly, increasingly attractive. And there's two very important reasons as to why. One, it's the shipping capital of the country. Not only is, the, is it a railroad hub, but if you think about where Chicago is located, it's right there on the Great Lakes, Lake Michigan. And so that made it even doubly beneficial, considering you've got not only a railroad industry, but a uh, marine shipping industry as well that will move your products around. The other reason that makes Chicago a very desirable place to do business was its large and growing population. Chicago is going to become an urban center, and what you're going to see is a lot of people internally locating into Chicago because that's where the jobs are. You are going to see immigrants, especially when Irish immigration begins to um, accelerate, same thing with the Germans, they're going to settle, many of them, in these urban centers because, again, that's where the jobs are. So for the two reasons of shipping and uh, large population, it made it cheaper to do business in Chicago. John Deere is going to realize this, and he'll move, around right about this time, he'll move his production from Virginia to Chicago because he can take advantage of the cheaper shipping rates in that part of the country. He can also take advantage of the higher populations, and anytime you have a higher supply of anything, I don't care if it's labor or if it's gasoline or whatever it is, the, the, the price is going to come down. That, that's, the, that's the law of supply and demand in free market exchange. John Deere realizes this and realizes that this is an advantage in the marketplace because ultimately what these two things are going to do is it's going to lower his over, overall operating um, expenditures. And in the process, what happens with John Deere is going to be very reflective of the American economy, generally speaking. You'll see this generally in the north. You see it much, much less in the south. Um, but you are going to begin to see the process of urbanization. When we say urbanization, all we mean is the rapid development of cities. And the example that I used with Chicago and John Deere in particular is very reflective of how things are going um, in the American economy, especially in the North. Um, you see a very similar trend in, in New York. You see it in Boston. Uh, you see it in Lowell, Massachusetts, for example. You see it in Lynn, Massachusetts, Slatersville, Rhode Island. What you're beginning to see is the development of what you and I would call cities. What cities are becoming are, are industrial centers. They're, they're centers where things are produced, whether that would be um, uh, processed food in places like Chicago or plows through John Deere in Chicago, or whether that's textile in uh, Lowell, Massachusetts, um, whether that is uh, shoes and boots in Lynn, Massachusetts. In any case, the, the, the cities are becoming bigger and bigger, more and more populated, and it's re the, the reason for this is the economy. It's, it's industrialization. For your notes, urbanization is directly linked to industrialization. This is one of those consequences that I was telling you about with respect to the unfolding of the capitalist industrial um, process in American history. When you get this change in the economy, you get a change in the demographics as well. You see the growth of cities. And this is going to have all kinds of implications that will you know, continue to reverberate in American history. Um, socially, the North is going to be far more diverse than the South. When those Irish and German immigrants come, they don't generally go. They don't gravitate to the um, South the same way that they do to the North. Um, same thing's going to happen with the Italians. Uh, same thing will happen with the Russians, the Chinese, later on in the, uh, in the early 20th century. Um, you also see the economy uh, uh, reflect this as well. You, you see clear-cut concentration of industry in the North. Meanwhile, the South still remains an agri agricultural economy. All of this is leading us into this conversation on a free labor economy. In the North, you do see a little more widespread prosperity, and you begin to see more expansion, economic expansion. And the North looks at itself, and it sees its prosperity as a direct reflection of what they're calling a free labor economy. In other words, our democratic values, 
our ability to contract our labor with whomever we please, this is the explanation for why we are, are flourishing and why the South is so much different. The free labor economy simply meant that you had the ability to do business with whomever you pleased. If you were a worker and you didn't feel like you were getting a very good paycheck with your current employer, you could always go to the guy down the road. You had that freedom of contract. The South's economy didn't work like that. It didn't matter if you were a slave, and obviously you weren't free to contract your labor with anybody, you were literally defined as property, but even white tenant farmers throughout the South, and there was plenty of white tenant farmers, people that essentially rented their land, they didn't have that freedom of contract that you see in the North. And so, generally speaking, there, there is this growing divide North and South that will be economic in its orientation, but ultimately will spill over to cultural issues over the course of time. The, the point that I'm trying to make, and the point that I'm really going to leave you with, is that the North and the South are going to increasingly grow further and further apart. As we've said from a very early standpoint in this class, part of this is what was, what, what was produced in both parts of the country. Another part of this involves political culture. And the idea of a free labor economy is very central in that idea. For right now, though, that's where I want to leave it. I'll see you the next time.